This programming is sponsored by the UH Health Family Care Center, offering primary care and behavioral health services on the University of Houston campus. Health insurance plans including Medicare and Medicaid accepted. New patient appointments and more at 832-UH-CARES. I see you. She was tapped to lead a new journalism program at her alma mater, Texas A&M, a college with the largest student body in the country. But the job offer fell apart and the university buckled under backlash when powerful individuals close to Texas A&M expressed opposition over her past work in diversity. Black journalists wouldn't be sent to Africa because how can they be objective? There have been women who've not been allowed to cover women's rights. Well, because they're women, they can't be objective. No one would question a white reporter covering Timothy McVeigh or anything. I'm Eddie Robinson, and stay tuned for a candid conversation with journalism professor Kathleen McElroy. As a new state law banning diversity measures goes into effect at public universities, what does this mean for journalists of color in tomorrow's newsrooms? Oh yeah, I feel you. We hear you. I see you. You're listening to I See You. I'm your host, Eddie Robinson. It was a cruel summer of 2023, but it's yielded a $1 million settlement to a celebrated journalism professor by the name of Kathleen McElroy. She worked as an editor for nearly 30 years, 20 of which were at the New York Times. She then went into the world of academia to study the intersection of race and news media and eventually becoming the director of the School of Journalism at the University of Texas at Austin between 2018 and 2022. So it was no surprise when earlier this year in 2023, her alma mater, Texas A&M, tapped her to revive its journalism program. It was a pageantry signing event with what the Texas Tribune described as fanfare, usually reserved for college coaches and athletes. Last month, Texas A&M celebrated the hiring of Kathleen McElroy. McElroy, an A&M graduate, was lured from the University of Texas where she was the director of the School of Journalism. But her hiring was sabotaged by a backlash over her past work promoting and improving diversity and inclusion in newsrooms. Keep in mind that a new state law will eventually limit measures of diversity and inclusion on college campuses in 2024. McElroy soon learned and was even warned by colleagues at A&M of an active campaign from unidentified individuals at Texas A&M at the time to remove her from this new journalism post. The initial offer of a tenured track position was reduced to a five-year post and then reduced again to a one-year position from which she could be fired at any time. McElroy turned to the media, the Texas Tribune to be exact, and speculated that all of this happened because of her race, maybe even her gender, and that others would face the same bars or challenges. She ultimately rejected the offer and withdrew her resignation from UT Austin as a journalism professor. The scandal also led to the resignation of the president of Texas A&M. And the nation's largest public schools institution's board of regents approved negotiating a $1 million settlement with the professor. But was this settlement a simple way of just swatting away a bigger problem? And will this incident make professors and administrators at Texas colleges fearful of setting off diversity red flags that they may censor themselves and avoid mentioning or naming communication dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion with their own students or in the public? I see you as we're truly grateful and excited to have with us a special guest on our show, Dr. Kathleen McElroy. Professor, thank you enormously for being a guest on ICU. Well, thank you for having me. Dr. McElroy informed us prior to the start of our chat that she's not at liberty to speak about the botched hiring at AM, but you can certainly read more about the resulting investigation, a widely reported formal apology, and what all happened during this incident by viewing links on our web article at icushow.org. Yeah, it's really an understatement to say that you've experienced some trials and tribulations in your life recently, (laughs) even literally, you know. um, But before we dive deep into everything, my first question to you is, how are you feeling? 
despite all that's happened and what you've had to endure over what my 80s pop group Bananarama called a cruel summer. How are you doing, Professor? Well, you know, um, I'm a Bananarama fan, so I get that. (laughs) But, you know, what I have experienced is so minor, so insignificant. I think that I am doing fine. And I really, really am more interested in people who don't get to tell their stories. So... I, if this was not a cruel summer for me, it was an eye opener, I would say more an eye opener. We'll find out more about that eye opening summer (laughs) later in our discussion. But look, you know, we're conducting this interview at a radio and TV station, Houston Public Media that sits in an area of Houston, a community of Houston that many consider to be the city's most diverse Black neighborhood located southeast of downtown. (laughs) It has a history unlike any other, Kathleen. And it too, the tray, has had its fair share of trials and tribulations, with this community being known as the epicenter of Houston's fight for racial equality. Just ask those brave men and women of the 60s, right? Just ask William Lawson and a number of Black college students who sat down at segregated lunch counters to protest discriminatory policies back then. It's where more seasoned saints, if you will, experience the power of the blues genre. You know, we're talking third ward here, a community in and of itself with such adversity, developed some truly amazing and remarkable people. For instance, Pat Parker, Garnett Coleman, Beyonce, Solange, powerhouse blues performers, Sam Lightning Hopkins, Arnett Cobb, Albert Collins. The list goes on. And we cannot omit from this list, Dr. Kathleen McElroy. Oh, no. The person you can't omit (laughs) is my father. Your father. I was going to say that. I was going to say that. (laughs) The contributions your family has made, the contributions your father has made, truly outstanding. So describe for us your childhood. That's what I'm getting at here. What was it like growing up in the tray? Third Ward, Texas. Go. Well, it's interesting because I was just looking at passages in the book, His Name is George Floyd, because they talk about parts of Third Ward and that. And in fact, the CUNY homes where my parents and all their friends first raised their families in the CUNY homes. And like their friends, I ended up getting a, you know, a start at home and then another home. So... When I read about how Third Ward in the 70s was this decaying thing, it's like, oh, I didn't know we were decaying. You know, the, it's almost like when pe- people talk about how they, I didn't realize, quote unquote, how poor I was. Well, we weren't poor, not by any means. We were decidedly middle class. Or maybe that's my imagination. Maybe we were poor and I just <laughs> didn't, didn't realize it. But... My parents both attended the Texas State School for Negroes. You know, they get out of the military. My mom outranked my dad. They were in different branches. Wow. Yeah, That's so, you know, there. this is how, you, yeah, you, you, you sort of, and my dad was a sports writer. He was the first um, black journalist for a daily newspaper in Texas. He was hired by the Houston Post. In fact, my middle name is Ovita because Ovita Culp Hobby signed off on his being hired. So I have this this history of journalism, but my dad's a yes. sports writer, but my mom was a bigger sports fan. <laughs> so, and I say that because I think in one sense, I'm empowered by the fact that I'm, I'm, you know, come from a very, very strong mother who grew up in Clarksdale, Mississippi, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, which was color purple type circumstances. Yes. So yes. anything that I, I being here, yeah. yeah, I, you know, I cannot complain. I can only praise them for what I got as a child. But to me, third ward was hearing the Texas Southern band practice at night because we grew up around the corner from Texas Southern and Archie Bell and the Drails was from fifth ward, not from third ward, I think, okay. um, doing tighten up. So I'm tied like, up. tied up, I'm like, you know, five or six or something. And hi, everybody. I'm Archie Bell in the Drowns of Houston, Texas. And we not only sing, but we dance just as good as we want. Hi, everybody.
everybody. I'm Archie Bell of the Trails of Houston, Texas. We don't only sing, but we dance just as good as we want. In Houston, we just started a new dance called the Tighten Up. And in Houston, so like to have the word Houston out like that, okay. And I didn't even realize it was a national hit. I just knew this is a song about Houston. And then, you know, less than a year later, the first word said on the moon is Houston. So I am first went to black Catholic school. So growing up, I thought everybody in third ward was black and Catholic. And then I ended up going to uh, public school. You mean black people? All black people aren't Catholic? What? <laughs> and then you find out there are white people and there are brown people. and that's a, So my thing is that Third Ward was this entity in and of itself. And didn't grow up in the richest neighborhoods. That would have been McGregor. But what's interesting to me is when you're a real estate fantasy, and when you're young, you don't call it a real estate fantasy, but when your dream of living large is within your same neighborhood, how empowering is that? You don't dream of moving out to the suburbs, if I even understood what the suburbs were, that I knew that there was poverty in my neighborhood and I knew there was wealth in my neighborhood. So I think that is part of how Third Ward can produce this array. Police officer was charged with murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. You know, the Third Ward that produced George Floyd is authentic as the Third Ward that produced Beyonce. And Zena Garrison. From the moment she discovered tennis as a 10-year-old in Houston, Zena Garrison was a force to be reckoned with. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this incredibly, in the true sense of the word, diverse neighborhood. Not racially diverse, in fact, segregated, but a diversity of income, of, you know, culture. When I was growing up, you know, the black tennis players that I knew on the pro tour, Zena Garrison and Lori McNeil, they were from Houston. So, and it wasn't about the football players and stuff. So I think that's just, I'm kind of fascinated how Third Ward helped shape me and empower me. And I'm wondering too, like the extraordinary journalist that you've become now, you know, how has Houston and Third Ward played a role on that note? in terms of shaping who you are right now as an individual? Well, because my dad was a journalist and he ran The Informer, um, a black newspaper in Houston. Um, I watched the news constantly. I read sports. I was okay. really into sports. I was ridiculously into sports. It was, I'm embarrassed now about the things I should have known about the world, but instead focused <laughs> And on sports. And by the way, my dad yeah. sued the University of Texas to attend its journalism school. And he was denied by the courts because they said the Texas State School for Negroes had an equal journalism program. And I've actually seen um, the letters. Uh, uh, Tony Peterson, who did remarkable work for the Chronicle, I believe, has just written a piece about him. And he found uh, one of the letters in which Painter as in, you know, sweat versus painter, called my dad a radical Negro, which if you knew my dad, and he was, you know, active in trying, in, in, you know, in the 60s and the 50s and Houston's integration effort. And another thing that shaped me is my parents and their friends love going to the Astrodome. They love going to the Astrodome. Now, the Astros were terrible then. <laughs> and, but it didn't matter. And I look back on it now, and I think it was because Roy Hofheinz had promised the Negroes of Houston that even if the civil rights lost and passed, that they would always be equal in the Astrodome. So I now see my parents happily giving the white um, person parking their cars or the attendant a dollar, and that person calling them, Yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. 
it wasn't about winning or losing, you know, it wasn't about the Astros on field performance. They were able to be in a space in which they were equal. They were just Astro fans. And I now see how profound that must have been given their backgrounds to be in this space and to be called sir and ma'am and to be led to your seat. Coming up, we continue our chat with University of Texas at Austin professor, Dr. Kathleen McElroy. She reveals what it will take to bring more journalists of color inside newsrooms today when disinformation tends to run rampant in this ever-changing digital news cycle. And how is she moving forward after the botched hiring incident at Texas A&M? A million dollar settlement is an awful lot of money, but at the end of the day, did A&M Board of Regents ultimately come out on top? I'm Eddie Robinson. I see you. We'll return in just a moment. If you're enjoying this program, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, I See You with Eddie Robinson. You can hear all the past episodes and be notified when new episodes are released. Also, please take a minute to give us a review or comment. We love getting feedback from our listeners. You're listening to ICU. I'm Eddie Robinson. Our guest is Dr. Kathleen McElroy, who found herself at the center of a story that she might have once worked on as a news editor before becoming a professor. Kathleen, a Black journalist with decades of experience at the New York Times and a reputation for promoting diversity in the workplace, was tapped to lead a new journalism program at Texas A&M. But powerful opponents at A&M took issue with her experience and watered down her job offer. McElroy ultimately rejected it and withdrew her resignation from UT Austin. In the end, A&M lost out on a renowned journalism professor. But in essence, was this what A&M really wanted in the first place? How will this impact journalists and university faculty of color when we speak of future hires and retention? Current students at public colleges are already concerned that a new state law in 2024, which bans DEI measures, will eventually impact certain activities, programs, and speech initiatives on campuses across Texas. We continue our chat with Professor McElroy, who's calling us virtually from Austin, Texas. Kathleen, I imagine you likely would have wrestled with how to talk about race in a hyper-politicized moment. And despite what happened at Texas A&M, in many ways, you can't quite help but think about your father, George McElroy, who was denied the opportunity to enroll at UT Austin because state officials at the time said, you know what, you can take journalism classes, but you'll need to uh, enroll at Texas State University for Negroes, which is now Texas Southern. This was despite the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision that you mentioned earlier, Sweat versus Painter. Mr. Mack, from what I know, that was his nickname, so to speak, right? Uh, that was his nickname. Become, he went on to become the first black reporter for the Houston Post. He taught at Yates High School right here in the Third Ward, led the journalism department at TSU for many, many years. He was also the first black to get a master's degree from the University of Missouri's famed journalism school. That's right. That's right. Amazing life. Your father, what, broke barriers, many barriers. And you, Kathleen, (laughs) became director of the journalism department at UT Austin 60 years after he was denied enrollment. Yes. Where's where's Prime Video? (laughs) Where's Hulu? (laughs) There must be a series of your life, the legacy of of your family, everything. And and it, it does, I see the passion that you have with regards to journalism. And my question to you here is, why aren't we seeing very many Black journalism students enter this arena? Are college newsrooms seeing many journalists of color these days? What do you think? Oh, now for 
a white journalism student, a lot of times their parents don't want them to go into journalism because there's not a lot of money in it or they they see the jobs. And I think that's the same thing for students of color. White students have an extra burden that many in their family may be hostile to journalism. That we had a student say that her mom told her friends that her daughter was majoring in lying. And think about, think about that level of rejection, but still wanting to be committed to journalism. I bring this all up because many students who would like to major in journalism are majoring in STEM because their parents are saying, you need to be doing, you know, it's engineering, it's science, it's, it's that. And journalism is low on the list, but at least because of broadcast journalism, our communities are exposed to journalists of color on air. I'm also a part of something called the Center for Ethical Leadership in Newsrooms. And what we find is that BIPOC journalists and women enter newsrooms at around the same rate. But as you move up in the ranks, as you look at leadership, it shrinks to practically nothing, to less than 5%. Imagine being a student wanting a Black or Latino, Latina student, a gay student wanting to work at places like the Daily Texan or the Battalion, which are much more welcoming now, but that can be intimidating. Do you see people who look like you in leadership positions? And I say now both campuses are putting young, dynamic students of color in leadership positions, but for the longest you didn't see that. So I think that's one thing. I also think a lot of journalism programs to this day focus on text or what used to be called print to begin with, where it's harder to sort of unearth people who look like you or things like that. And I worked at the Times for 20 years and I had bylines mostly in sports and some other stuff, but you wouldn't know me. I, you know, students wouldn't know who I am because they really, really wouldn't see my byline, even though I was helping pick which stories went on the front page of the Sunday and Monday editions of the New York Times. So if you don't know like the powerful people behind the scenes, so I think in a lot of factors, students really may not see themselves or they feel as if, you know, maybe this is not my place. Look, I am so old that when I was getting my degree in broadcast journalism, no, I admit I'm an old person. A professor took me aside and said, I need to tell you, you're too dark to be on the air. You'll never be on the air because I am chocolate. I am the color of good rue for gumbo. Wow. And, and back then, people, my skin tone, weren't on the air. So, and now we're getting to the point where if you have braids, you can be on the air. So it's evolving, but I, you're right. There, many of the people who are in journalism are not students of color. The notion of trust, you know, we say that a lot you know, here as a public media entity. But I loved what you said in an interview, and I wanted you to expand on how do you look at that as a journalist and, and as a, a leader in journalism, you know, moving forward in this day and age? People need to understand that disinformation, okay, that we even have that word is a terrible thing. That the one of the major points of especially... Russian level of disinformation is to just sow confusion. Some of these lies and things that are being said are so outrageous that the point is for people just to throw up their hands and trust nothing. A lot of times people want to teach media literacy to journalism majors. Well, they kind of get that in every class. I want us to get that to education majors and engineering majors and things like that. Understanding the role of disinformation. And part of that is that you trust nothing. So all folks like me, you know, will have their little favorite stations and their favorite this. And by the way, journalism is a flawed profession. 
a flawed field because it's run by humans. And even if AI becomes more involved, who's programming it? Who's doing the algorithms? So journalism is not perfect by any means. And I've actually studied the ways journalism has so distrust and mistrust in communities. But it is our better tool. It is our better tool. But that's what's so hard is that people, there are forces out there that want people to trust nothing. I'm Eddie Robinson, and this is ICU. And we're speaking with journalism professor Kathleen McElroy. And Kathleen, what you said just a moment ago about artificial intelligence, AI, makes me think a lot about the evolution of journalism, right? And I think about your father and the world he lived in of covering the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. And while we are in a different world now, a lot of that struggle from back in the day is still going on. You know, look at how race and gender are affecting your career. You know, I wonder how your father, if we could channel him, what he would be saying. You know, like, I see you. I see what's happening here. Yeah, I have a voice. I want to change. I want to be a part of telling stories of my community. But what he would be saying would more than likely be on TikTok or some other platform that only gives you 30 seconds. <laughs> but I, I don't consider TikTok evil. Or one of those things. In fact, you know, there's some really good TikTok, news related TikTok. The Washington Post for the longest has been, has, well, for the longest, how long has it been around? Um, But your point is that there is this world of information, but it's not necessarily um, evidence based. Right. And I'm curious as to if professional journalists, you know, can make a career out of this. Yo, absolutely. Well, maybe not in TikTok, but we don't know what that next thing is. So one of the beautiful things about teaching 19-year-olds is that you're not so much teaching them a particular device or a particular medium. You're teaching them how to produce evidence-based information worth sharing on whatever that next thing is. And I think it's especially important for journalists of color and journalists from underrepresented groups to be at the table when they're building that next thing. Because a lot of journalism has been reacting to it. Now, in my dad's age, you know, the black press played a very important role in, you know, deciphering the message. And we still have a robust uh, black press. But it's not, it doesn't hit as much of all of the black community as it did before. Um, we know we have the Defender Network and, you know, sure. other outlets. But yeah. part of the reason why there was a black press, a Latino press, an ethnic press, is because the mainstream press, quote unquote, was that default was white patriarchal cis type news, right? It was, and to this day, it's still that way. And to be... To be perfectly clear, journalism is best when everybody is understanding how you have a fully dimensional news report. So it's not just built on, you know, bodies, like on our bodies. So, but for the longest, it's been our bodies that have been trying to get the message out. And and then for my dad, that was extraordinarily important. You know, and but you know what? He wasn't given that many options. He didn't get nearly the number of Hmm. options and opportunities that I did. Um, Yeah, sure. So I know I've gone a little bit far afield here. And there are, um, you know, outstanding journalists from underrepresented groups. It seems like it's fewer than at the beginning of this century or at the end of last century. And that's what's heartbreaking um and it's not heartbreaking because our story isn't being told it's just heartbreaking because professions are more robust when they are fully dimensional well in march of 2022 you gave a lecture for the national press foundation where you talked about objectivity ah yes and and i'm wondering 
Less than a year later, here in 2023, do you believe your blackness weaponized against you? I'm not going to talk about me specifically. Okay. As I said then, and I've written in other instances, the whole issue with objectivity is that it was never objective. It was a strategy. In fact, objectivity as a whole was a business strategy of newspapers at one point to be more profitable than partisan press. So it's always been a strategy. In the way that objectivity is often used in newsrooms, for instance, is that, and uh, Pamela Newkirk uh, wrote an amazing book about this. I think it's called Within the Veil. I might have gotten the name wrong, but Pamela Newkirk, uh, I think she produced this book in 1998. And she talked about how Black journalists were not allowed to cover the O.J. Simpson trial because they wouldn't be objective. And for the longest, Black journalists wouldn't be sent to Africa because how can they be objective about that? There have been women who've not been allowed to cover women's rights. Well, because they're women, they can't be objective. No one would question a white reporter covering Timothy McVeigh or anything, right? So I think that's the way that I talk about this in terms of newsrooms, in that there is a sense that by having an identity marker, people will focus in on that without maybe seeing how your authority and your expertise in that area adds so much. So when I talk to students, I talk about how can you be fully dimensional? How can you be accurate? Like. How can you approach truth? All right. So facts are meaningless. Individual facts are meaningless. If a red car hits a blue car in the street and you come away from that, that the red car hit the blue car, that's not what's important. But those are facts. So what's interesting in terms of the term objectivity and why many of us in journalism are moving away from it is because people never really were. And that maybe there's another term, but we've yet to come up with it. It isn't being fair because I, you know, I'm going to be fair. I am not going to take points off, you know, Brittany's paper because I know that she struggled on her job this week. Well, that's not fair to the other students. So once you bring in the concept of fairness, that's not the right term. And of course, so much of journalism, unfortunately, has become he said, she said which is stenography, you know? So so it's like getting, don't use objectivity as a crutch. So I'm going to talk to five people and try to get a diversity of voices. And some voices aren't legitimate. There are people who legitimately think that the vaccine was not good for them. That's fine. But then there are people who were just pure anti boxers or people who are white supremacists who maybe don't belong in a report. And this is what we saw with climate change. People felt as if, well, I should get someone who's anti-climate change in this piece so it can seem balanced. Well, that's not understanding how statistics work. And the scientists didn't know how to talk to journalists and the journalists didn't understand what the scientists were saying. And yeah, it's 107 degrees outside. (laughs) So uh, that's a long way to say that objectivity has been this like tool. And maybe we need to figure out what that thing is that does approach a fully dimensional um, look at truth. Coming up, we wrap up our conversation with University of Texas at Austin professor, Dr. Kathleen McElroy. We start to dive deeper into understanding the notions of objectivity and what it means to be biased. In storytelling as a journalist, who gets to be a narrator now? Can it be a person who's conservative or liberal? 
does race or ethnicity of the narrator matter? Let's hear from you. Give us your perspectives. Share your thoughts and send us an email. Talk at I-S-E-E-U show.org. I'm Eddie Robinson. Don't move. Our final segment of ICU comes your way right after this. If you're enjoying this program, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, ICU with Eddie Robinson. You can hear all the past episodes and be notified when new episodes are released. Also, please take a minute to give us a review or comment. We love getting feedback from our listeners. You're listening to ICU. I'm your host, Eddie Robinson. We're speaking with Dr. Kathleen McElroy of the University of Texas at Austin, In many ways, we've been workshopping what her journalism class might look like after her experiences this summer. Are we still having the conversation, the reckoning on race we thought America had finally confronted in 2020? Or has the reckoning expired, so to speak? We don't need measures of inclusion or diversity anymore. Some folks, including state officials, think that's exactly the case. Dr. McElroy is calling us virtually from Austin, Texas. On the year 2020, Mm -hmm. the death of George Floyd being witnessed on video, Mm -hmm. there indeed was this awakening, right? There Mm -hmm. was a reckoning, if you will, where Americans sort of became divided on whether an increased focus on race would ultimately lead to major policy change. People were divided with that. I found myself torn because as a news anchor at the time here at Houston Public Media, Notions of being stopped by police. You know, I had these experiences under my belt, but I was being pulled over when I was in 11th grade and in high school in Mississippi. But I've also had experiences, you know, in New York City. I lived there for 20 years almost, and I got an NYU master's in media ecology in 2000. I almost majored in that. Yeah, it's, it was amazing. I loved it, but it really sort of threw me off because <laughs> it unveiled the curtain. It pulled yes. the curtain wide open. Yes. And it shocked me. And I almost wanted to say, forget journalism, because it really destroyed my mental state of what journalism really was. And I started taking courses like manufacturing news. Oh, I took that the course. The uses and effects of political propaganda in the USSR. And Oh, uh, you know, I can relate to so many things you're talking about. So I did, I did end up getting a degree in journalism research from NYU. Um, I got it from the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, and I studied awesome. race and media because I didn't okay. know about the media okay. ecology degree till after the um, till later. Steinhardt School of Education. Um, yeah, that's see? exactly where it was. Yes. So I think I'm going to disagree with you on one thing. You said that yes, George Floyd in 2020, uh, America was divided by race. America has always been divided by race. You're right. That's that's a perfect point. You're it right. May, it may not admit it, but your other point, the thing that you're saying that's so insightful is, and I've studied this, I did a case study, what journalists of color, their reaction to everything with 2020, with George Floyd, because all of a sudden, Black journalists and Latino journalists are getting arrested by the cops in these mm-hmm. covering protests, right? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? A news reporter is arrested live on the air. Omar Jimenez, a CNN correspondent, was on the streets of Minneapolis covering the protest and fires surrounding the death of George Floyd. And there was like, wait a second, just because I look like this, I'm being That's right. fill in the blank. And things that were happening in newsrooms. There were major shifts in newsrooms all over America because journalists realized we can't just be on the sidelines. We see this affecting ourselves, our children, our families. So at that point, you see how being quote unquote objective, which would be just, I'm going to report this, but I'm not going to put in how this affects me. Well, how this is affecting you is a legitimate news angle. And it took newsrooms a while to figure out how to sort of balance. And I think there's still a question. I think so too. 
in 2020, it just it, it, it threw me off because I was trying to figure out why was I not necessarily afraid of reporting anything? No. You know, I even co-hosted the funeral right. um, of George Floyd with mm-hmm. a colleague of mine. Right. But it was as if I almost wanted to just scream as I'm reporting because of of wanting to just kind of, you know, go there. But you can't because you're trying to remain unbiased and you're trying to you're you're making sure that you're balanced and having a balanced reporting taking care of, of yourself the events mentally of what was going on but i would have to do that when i turn the mic off well you know, <laughs> you know i would have to do that if i'm walking out you know and going to my car and to just be relaxed and i think that's that's one of the difficult things is that you know if someone goes on air and say america grieves the so and so and there can be this default i'm speaking for the world the royal we you know and I think what's tough is that for journalists from underrepresented groups, we yes. want to surface the stories of people like us, but not always the pathological, you know, thing. Want to say, this hurts. It's trying to figure out how to say, this hurts. And and the question is, if you're telling this, this story, is your body being unbiased and being unbiased is absolutely what we all strive for. Correct. Objectivity and unbiased are not the same things. And I think that's one of the things the public doesn't quite get. But I think that you look at the 2020 white reckoning, you look at Sandy Hook, you look at Uvalde. And I think one of the things that's so painful is that what has changed you know, but we have to keep doing this. And I want to make sure that my students are inspired. There you go. To do this and that they can feel confident in their training and their ethics that I am telling this story the best way it can be told. It doesn't matter what I look like, what my background is, but I am going to take a 360 look at anything I'm doing. I'm going to try to get the voices that can help fully tell a story. If you're doing a a story on sunburns, you should get a dermatologist who is a person of color. You know, like really understanding so you can add that element that makes your story better than the typical story. I remember once I was teaching this class and the students were, they had to talk, describe their roommates. And I had someone who was evaluating me and the students are going, okay, my roommate, um, Becky, she's white. She's da-da-da-da-da. And this person asked me, how did you get white students to understand that they were white? And this is this was like years ago. This was in the in the 80s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was it, it's sort of like letting people understand that you're not the default. There you go. And and letting other people understand that you are not secondary. This is ICU. I'm Eddie Robinson, and we're speaking with Kathleen McElroy of the University of Texas at Austin's School of Journalism and Media. Dr. McElroy recently went through a botched hiring process at Texas A&M. And I think what you're saying here, Dr. McElroy, is really important, that it's not about saying, I don't see race or I don't see a person's color, because what ends up happening is that white becomes the default. And that alone maintains white privilege, right? I mean, the reality is that people of color are reminded of this every day with microaggressions and even blatant discrimination. So in many ways, we should directly address race. We should be addressing it unapologetically. You know, what are you seeing and hearing from your students? Are they you know, going to practice journalism in a totally different way than, say, we thought possible? You know, younger folks get most of their news from apps. I get my news from apps. And they just happen to be they just happen to be more like, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. There you go. And the Houston Chronicle. It's not Facebook. <laughs> um <laughs> nah. But yeah, I mean how does how does that affect the way you teach journalism to the well, next generation? You know, journalism at its core is the gathering and sharing of evidence based relevant, significant information for a good reason. 
Now that good reason could be a recipe or it could be to understand that you're living on a floodplain. Okay. So how you communicate that message may change with the medium, but there are some basics in journalism. You know, I've seen students write an amazing story and maybe all the commas are all in the right space. That's okay. We can figure that part out, but how are you gathering the information? How are you sharing it? And how are you understanding the big picture of it? So I think the fundamental things that we're teaching them can go to any medium or, you know, we teach, I don't teach data journalism, but we're teaching our students data journalism, how to build apps, how to create news in different, you know, ways that we didn't really think about because it'll be something different in three or four years. What's important is you've taught them how to learn something. I can't help but think about your sunburn example, where you mentioned and stated that you'd ask a person of color for that news item. And in essence, you know, you've just promoted or offered up an idea of inclusion within that reporting, right? Yes. And and, and, and I'm I'm trying to figure out, is that how we move forward with Texas state officials? When they pull away or try to dismantle DEI and those three letters, you know, it sounds like you just you caused a riot when you mentioned those three letters. What in terms of looking at the future, moving forward, are we to not use DEI and not use those words and those, you know, those inclusive words? So that we can get the point across of making sure that we can include everybody well, you in, know, a, in a news feature? The term DEI or DEIB or in various other versions of that, these terms are relatively new. And be, before these terms, these terms came about because we at least wanted a rhetorical way to express why this is important. There are people who really don't want students to understand the importance of things that many of us think are important. And maybe they're going after the rhetoric. They are going after the rhetoric. Many of us still believe in the actual action behind whatever term it is. And so you're not going to put public money into that, then we'll figure out something else. I'm here because of the things that my father and my mother did in their generation. And I am not going to abandon the next generation just because a term is now banned or unpopular. Maybe we call it cheeseburger. (laughs) (laughs) Don't say that because I'm hungry. But yeah, I mean, clearly clearly I'm joking, but you know, I, the work continues. And it will continue to remain work, which gets at the heart of my last and final question that we always ask our guests of all the accomplishments of what you've had to endure, especially over the course of the summer of 2023 with your case being settled, what lessons have you learned about yourself thus far? It's been a little weird to have my own waking Ned Divine moment. I think that was the name of that movie. <laughs> Number 29, 29. Yes. Yes. I love that movie. It was phenomenal. When you hear all these I loved it. wonderful things being said about me, that that there are people who support me, but I've also learned that things that we don't know about the world. There are things, people who 
I bring up the Wall Street Journal reporter who's been detained in Russia. We're continuing to follow breaking news on the arrest of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Russian officials detained the U.S. citizen for suspicion of spying. Our energy needs to go to his case. So what I've learned is that I may think that I'm in a fishbowl or I've been in one, but I really haven't that this is a world we live in. And my goal is to remain an active part of this world and helping people find their voice, helping people feel as empowered as as I have felt my entire life. And that's why Third Ward is important to me because this sense of empowerment And I also realized that I am privileged to have had the background and the connections I had. Thank you. This was almost a a journalism 101 (laughs) class without having to pay for it. I love teaching journalism 101. I would love (laughs) I would love to teach that to adults. Which you don't need the class. Yeah, you right? ace it. You ace it. But oh. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I've learned so much from your programs and looking at, you know, past podcasts and this opportunity to think about life is is such a blessing. And I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. She's professor in the School of Journalism and Media at the University of Texas at Austin. Her name, Kathleen McElroy. Thank you so much for being a guest on IC. Our team includes technical director, Todd Holslander. Producer, Laura Walker. Editors, Mincho Jacob and John Mitchell Good. ICU is a production of Houston Public Media. Follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to or download your favorite shows. I'm your host and executive producer, Eddie Robinson. And I feel you. We hear you. I see you. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.